We're a UK educational charity and a membership organisation which exists to promote and support the study of dress from around the world and throughout history. We've got around 600 members and we have a wide range of activities including the publication of the journal Costume, a programme events, talks, visits and the annual conference. And our magazine The Thread and our social media activity keeps members, followers and friends up to date with what the society and its members are up to. So we were formed nearly 60 years ago at a time when that was prompted by a growing popular fascination in the history of dress and a need to share research and knowledge across a wide sector of interest. Over the last 20 years, we've been fortunate to receive a number of generous legacies from members, and those now allow us to directly discharge our charitable purposes, supporting conservation in public museums, giving grants for people to undertake research, um, enabling volunteers to do work experience in museums, and rewarding and recognising excellence in creativity and design. Janet Arnold was a founder member of the Society and one of her patterns for an 18th century dress appeared in the first ever edition of Costume in 1967. Janet was an influential figure in the drive for detailed, honest and analytical research into historic dress, both in terms of styles and the methods of cut and construction. So for those of us that were lucky enough to have known her personally, um, if you heard her lecture, it was like watching a virtuoso performance. To spend any time with her socially was to share her delight in nearly everything and also to enjoy her rather impish sense of humour. Um, she was so hardworking and passionate about dress history, but most people know her from her books, her beautiful drawings and also her patterns. The importance and influence of Janet's work is evident in museums across the world. She was a charismatic teacher, much in demand as a lecturer across Europe and in North America. And while she was lecturing and teaching, those travels also allowed her to gather more and more evidence of the development of dress. And her aim was always to share this knowledge as widely as she possibly could. Janet was awarded the inaugural Sam Wanamaker Award in 1998 and she was really proud to have been made an elected fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London. And after her death, both the Society of Antiquaries and the Costume Society honoured her memory with grants for students studying in her field. Janet left her archive to the School of Historical Dress, who rose to the challenge not only of curating the enormous collection of slides, drawings and other material, but also finishing as many of her planned books as of the Patterns of Fashion series as were actually feasible. We honoured Janet's memory first with the Patterns of Fashion Awards. That recognised the achievement of students in recreating a garment from one of ja Janet's Patterns of Fashion books, backed up with direct research on similar surviving garments in public museums and other relevant materials. And then in 2019, we inaugurated the Patterns for Performance Award, allowing for the interpretation and development of one of Janet's patterns as a costume for a character in a performance. And these two awards, which bear Janet's name, allowed the society to continue to advocate for the use of her publications as a source for the accurate reproduction of historic dress and also for the reinterpretation of those garments for dramatic effect. They're a tribute to both Janet's contribution to the history of dress and the creative excellence of people who are in the beginning of their careers as designers and makers. From her career teaching in London, she knew that students were the key to the future. And in her will, she made it clear that it was students that mattered to her most. My name is Natasha Bowles and I'm the maker of the red satin 1615 to 1620s doublet from Patterns of Fashion 3. I entered this competition because I really wanted to challenge myself and give myself a hands-on education of historical garments. I've also never really done menswear before, so it was a great opportunity to look more into that. I chose this pattern because I was really specifically wanting to look into this era. It's sort of the era that bridges the gap between the Tudors and the Charles I era, and I was just really intrigued by sort of the specific pattern. It's very similar to the Richard Cotton suit, and for me, that 
gave me another element of research. I could do a lot of comparison and I could really get to grips with the research side of things. From the beginning, I knew that it was probably going to be unlikely to go and view some of these extant garments at the VNA and other museums. And therefore, from the beginning, I knew that my research was going to have to be pulled from portraits and written documents. And as somebody who loves research, that really excited me to have to be able to piece together this jigsaw. However, this did create problems when making. There were a few instances I really did need to look at extant garments and I was very lucky that one of my friends had gone to the VNA in the past and took loads of pictures of all these doublets from this era and they were very nice in sharing these details with me. The tiny seam allowances were also a pain as once I handled the garment more they started to fray and wick away to nothing. So I created a system of cutting out a piece and then using it and doing what I needed with it. So it started with making the body, then the sleeves, then the wings, then the collar and sort of piecing them all together at the end. So it sort of gave as little time as possible for each seam to sort of fray. Another issue that occurred during this process was the fact I didn't have a belly piece pattern. So I had to use loads of reference from Janet Arnold's book, especially the Richard Cotton suit, to create a new and digitise a new pattern piece. So the five layers of it. By using these references, I was able to create one that had the best style, cut and shape and thicknesses for each of the pieces. So I think my attempt was very accurate in recreating what it would have been inside this garment. I did fully commit myself to the research side of this project. I really enjoyed it, so it was very easy to be really engaged in the project. I almost had to forget everything I've been taught with hand sewing and learn new stitches, new phrases, new sort of ideas of making to make sure I made this garment as it would have been made. I almost created a new process as well for me for making by taking Janet Arnold's notes, taking my research and creating a new list of instructions on how to make this doublet, which worked very well because it meant that I could keep track of time and I could really make sure that each piece was intricately made and very well made to how it would have been. Even though it took me 500 hours and I still can't feel my fingers, I'm so happy for getting through this challenge and I'm so proud of myself for what I've achieved. Hello, I'm Millie Whitefield and I'm the maker of the 1625 to 1630 doublet from Nora Wars The Cut of Men's Clothes. I have a real interest in historical costume and tailoring, so when the Patterns of Fashion competition brief was set as menswear, I knew it would be the perfect undertaking to develop my skills as a tailor. The competition pushed me to make what I feel is my most detailed and beautiful work. When deciding which pattern to make, I knew I wanted to choose something that would challenge me. This is what led to me choosing something from the 17th century, as I knew I would have to sew it entirely by hand to keep it historically accurate. The 17th century was also a time where menswear was very flamboyant and exciting. It really intrigued me to see how the tailoring of a doublet couples with its more decorative elements. The slash design and structured shape of the 1625 to 1630 doublet is what really appealed to me the most. There are only three photos of the doublet in the V&A archives, therefore I had to use a lot of other existing doublets with similar styles to support my construction choices. Also, due to the period I was working from, there were not very many pieces available to view and none that I was able to handle to really get an idea of the making methods. Luckily, the book, 17th Century Men's Dress Patterns, had loads of detailed images of all the elements of similar doublets. This book was a key reference point for me during the construction. The sash style of doublet also only existed for around five years from 1620, which also limited my resources while researching. One of the most difficult challenges I faced was the number of buttons, buttonholes and eyelets. As all these elements were not only functional but also decorative, it was crucial for them to be uniform and neat. So before committing to the actual costume, I first did many samples so that I had the techniques well mastered. The hand cover buttons were probably my biggest undertaking. Altogether, the doublet has 79. These were all made with a wooden bead as the base with silk thread woven over the top. During the making process, I found any free moment where I couldn't be sewing the main doublet to make buttons, with train journeys being a prime button making time for me. 
Altogether, I estimate that the doublet took me over 300 hours of hand sewing. I'm so happy with the costume I produced and the new knowledge I have gained, and I'm even happy to, happier to have been chosen as a finalist for this year's Patterns of Fashion competition. Hello, my name is Eleanor Salisbury and I decided to recreate an 18th century court suit using the patterns from pages 74 and 75 from Nora Rule's book The Cut of Men's Clothes with additional information from Costume Close-Up and the V&A website, along with observations of original garments. I've wanted to make a frock coat for as long as I can remember and this seemed like the perfect opportunity to do so. I wanted to choose a project that would showcase my hand sewing skills, develop my knowledge of historical menswear and allow me to try my hand in not only historical tailoring techniques but also enable me to investigate historical embroidery methods. The original suit is currently in storage at the V&A. I based the shirt off the pattern on page 82 where the only thing that I changed was the number of buttons on the collar and not attaching a frill around the wrist. The reason for these changes was to enable the shirt to better suit the time of the outfit I made. All of the alterations came from primary and secondary sources, including information by Nora Wall. The shirt was made of linen and constructed with hand felled seams using a wax linen thread. The waistcoat is a subsidiary item created to accompany the suit, as no pattern was given for the waistcoat but photos were available from the VLA. I studied three extant waistcoats from the University Archive and used my findings together with the photographs of the original to create the pattern. I enlarged the flat lay of the waistcoat photos from the website to life size before tracing and scanning it onto the computer and adding colour to create a digital print of the embroidery. I decided that leaving the waistcoat plain would have stood out and looked strange against the embroidered coat and as images of the original were available, it would have been a shame to not show off the suit in its entirety. I was unable to examine a pair of 18th century breeches in person, so decided to combine the information and photographs available on the VLA website with other sources to inform their construction. The breeches and coat are made of dyed calico, fully lined and sewn with a wax linen thread using predominantly backstitch. Construction of the coat and choice of the interlining fabrics and shapes came from looking at two original 18th century coats, a 1790s hunting coat and an earlier embroidered court coat as well as the information provided in the two books. The main issue I ran into with the pattern was the length of the front and back side seams. They were one inch different so the front needed to be altered. I chose the front rather than the back because the back pattern lined up perfectly with the scaled up embroidery design whereas the front embroidery and pocket placement did not match the photos from the v &A. I studied photos of the original in great detail by blowing up the images. From this, I noticed that the embroidery on the back of the coat was far coarser than the embroidery on the front, seen mainly where the sequin sprigs were embroidered, as the stitching between the sequins on the front are sewn as Vs using four separate stitches, whereas the back is created with two stitches crossing the sequin line to form an X. I decided to only embroider half the coat so that the cut and line of the coat could be clearly seen in the unembellished half in comparison to how the embroidery draws the eye to certain features. In order to scale up the embroidery and the pink applique, I enlarged the photos of the pocket flap so that it measured the same as the pocket flap of the coat pattern provided. One element I noticed in the original garment was that the white satin stitch edging was embroidered over paper. I incorporated this element into the coat embroidery and was pleased with the effect created. Hi, my name is BB4 and I'm one of the nominees of this year's Patterns for Performance Award. From the moment I heard about this competition, when I was a first year student at Wimbledon College of Arts, I knew I wanted to participate. Nearly three years later, the time was finally here and I was working on a set of desi designs for a film version of Verdi's Aida. We had a choice between several classical texts and although some of them were originally set in the 19th century and they may have been a more logical choice to pair with Nora Wolk and Janet Arnold's patterns, I chose to design for Aida anyways. I was interested to see as to whether I could make these historical patterns my own and try to make them fit in a different era. And so I entered the competition with a costume designed for Aida's high priest named Ramphis. Rumphus is a man of faith, he's cunning and has strong beliefs. Um, his words have great power as the king follows his advice blindly, which makes Rumphus a pivotal chess piece in the fate of Aida and her forbidden lover. I wanted him to actually look a bit like a chess piece, like an icon and for his costume to be opulent and quite restricting. 
Initially, I struggled choosing a pattern for my design as I flipped through the books in search for one that would fit. And so I went back and forth between my research on priests all over the world, ancient Egyptian references and the patterns in the books. And it wasn't until I started to think more freely about how to fill in the blank canvas that was a historical pattern that I suddenly found the perfect marriage between a 17th century gown and my idea for the high priest silhouette. I enlarged every aspect of the original gown while simplifying the shape as I wanted to use it as a surface for my screen print designs. Making this costume has been an enormous learning curve, so much more than I'd expected before I started this project, as the pattern itself looked quite straightforward. But after transferring the pattern to true scale, I was amazed at how small people back then actually were, and this made estimating the proportions a bit difficult, especially when I went to lengthen and widen the pattern. Unfortunately, I also only had access to online resources, on similar garments, and even though these were quite scarce as well, in combination with Janet Arnold's references, I was able to get a clear image of the construction and then make it my own. In addition, I've designed and printed eight prints on the costume, which consist of over 20 meters of fabric in total, and this took nearly two weeks, but I absolutely think it was worth it. Entering the competition has encouraged me to think about silhouette in a different way, and it set the tone for my other designs for Aida as well. After I graduate, I would love to design costumes for film, and I'm hoping I can keep combining my love for mixing print, historical dress, and modern day styles, and that being a finalist in this competition might help me take a step in that direction. Thank you so much. My name is Caroline Husband. I will talk about my work on the character Herman for the Queen of Spades. I decided to take part in this adventure that is pattern for performance as I think it is such a fantastic opportunity. The Queen of Spades is a very tragic opera, as many other are, of course. I think this one is very special for its main character, Herman. Um, Herman is not your usual or typical main character. I definitely think the audience should not be rooting for him. He is a very complex, twisted and obsessed character. Herman is a soldier and we quickly understand at the beginning of the play that there is a war that's happening. That was one of my reasons to choose the Regency era because of the Napoleonic War, but that's not the only reason. I was really inspired or fascinated by both the art movement of Gothic and Romanticism. One of the ideas of the Gothic movement is that there is a monster inside of us. I really wanted to represent this darkness inside of Herman. And for the Romanticism, my idea was to show the audience or maybe try to make them feel what Herman was feeling. And by using projection projection mapping I thought that I could achieve showing Herman's soul. I think that projection mapping is very trending right now. A lot of people think that opera is quite a dusty art form and I think that this is a way to prove them wrong. For the making of my costume I went through both Janet Arnold and Nora Vaughan's books and I quickly realized that I had everything I needed in Nora Vaughan's book. For the pantaloons and the waistcoat the choice was quite easily made. Both of the patterns were exactly precisely what I needed. The coat I struggled a little bit more as there are no military outfits in her book um, but I chose one of her coats from the same period and I decided to develop it into a military inspired garment. So for the making of the waistcoat I decided to construct my back on the mannequin and so I layered and pleated around the fabric but as the fabric is quite soft I had to fuse it with another fabric to create more body to the pleat. The making of the coat was the most difficult part for me as there were many fittings that definitely was the piece that had the most correction. Tailoring is quite different than dressmaking in my opinion and it was fantastic to learn about all those new tailoring techniques, all the body canvassing all those hand stitches. I decided to work with modern sleeve and I try to keep them as simple and traditional as possible. If you have a keen eye on historical patterns, you can absolutely see that. To conclude this video, I would like to thank the Costume Society for having this competition and I would like to wish the best of luck to the other finalists. Hi, I'm Amelia and I've entered into this year's Costume Society Patterns for Performance Award. 
My work tends to take influence from art and history and over my studies I've really loved learning how to read history through dress. This competition really celebrates what costume design is capable of, which is why I chose to enter it. The story that I chose to design for is The Rivals, a comedy written by Richard Sheridan in 1775 set in Bath. I've designed for the character Captain Jack Absolute, playing on the satirical connotations of the story alongside the neoclassical art movement. I really hope that my interpretation of the character can be read as something quite ornate and cultured, but also a little bit campy and exaggerated. For my silhouette, I wanted to create a hybrid of classic late 18th century suits with military greatcoats. The Nora wall pattern that I ended up choosing became the perfect starting point to then introduce greatcoat design features to it. I really loved learning about Nora wall and going through all of her patterns. Um, I loved particularly her quotations from contemporary sources that became really integral to my research informing me of both aristocratic and military dress of the period. Every detail of this costume has a historical starting point and is then tweaked to fit my concept. The collar is an example of this. It was the final and definitely the most technical part of this costume and took a few attempts to really figure out how to get it done. Structurally, I was creating three collars emerging from the neck, so it was very difficult. And then on top of this, I did pattern matching. Which I've used illustrations executed with printing and embroidery to visually tell certain narratives within the story. I was able to create two prints designs, first inspired by cameos of neoclassical art, and within my cameos I chose to illustrate details of the story. On the external jacket, I created a further few print designs that are a little bit more decadent, their placement intended to mimic embroidery on 1770s suits. Um, suits of this time were often designed to really come alive within candlelight, so I then worked into my print with embroidery and beading to really give it another dimension. I found myself during this period referring back to my toile often, where I ended up taking a sharpie and drawing all of my print ideas onto it so that I could really ensure that it was in sync with the movement and the structure of the jacket. The surface decoration was one of the more intensive aspects of the jacket, but really delivered on this almost celestial look that I was going for. This competition has allowed me to embed my character into the 18th century, but it's also allowed me to create a design that's loyal to my style and hopefully desirable to a modern audience. I think costume has an amazing ability to entice people into gaining an interest in history, so I'm really thankful to the Costume Society for nurturing this philosophy and allowing me the chance to share and speak about my work more. Thank you.